Welcome back to the Tapes Archive podcast, where we release interviews that need to be heard. Last week, we released an interview with David Lee Roth from 1984. This week, we are releasing another Roth interview, but 35 years later. We go from the height of Roth's career to his twilight years. I believe this interview is one of the most honest and humble interviews he's ever given. He speaks very candidly on many topics. At the time of this interview in 2019, Roth was 65 years old and was promoting his line of tattoo skin care products called Ink the Original. In the interview, Roth talks at great lengths about his parents and growing up, the beginning and ending with Van Halen, why he never got married, why he's never happy, plus so much more. The interview was conducted by Debbie Millman and was originally aired on her award-winning, awesome podcast, Design Matters. We are so grateful that Ms. Millman is allowing us to share one of the most insightful David Lee Roth interviews with you. I will add a link to her podcast in the description and highly recommend you subscribe today. Thanks for tuning in, and now it's time to open the vault. When David Lee Roth was a boy, he liked to draw at the kitchen table. When he asked his mom to come over and look at what he'd created, before she did so, she would ask, Should I get a magnet? In other words, either the drawing was worthy of being displayed on the kitchen refrigerator, or he was wasting her time. David Lee recalls looking down at his drawing and thinking, I can do better. David Lee Roth is still pursuing mastery. The lead singer of Van Halen is just back from the Ultra Music Festival in Miami, where he performed an electronic dance remix of his classic 1980s song, Jump. David Lee is a best-selling author, a multi-platinum rock and roll star, and a businessman. Today, I'm going to talk to him about his multifaceted career and about some of his latest projects, one of which is a new line of skincare products for tattoos. David Lee Roth, welcome to Design Matters. Wow, that's a hell of an intro. Yeah, you're a pretty impressive dude. <laughs> a humanitarian. Absolute philanthropist. I don't know, what, when you look in the mirror in the morning, we always recreate ourselves, especially here in the United States. And if you live in the here in New York City, this is like a Benetton ad going crazy. Every, every nationality, every great accent, within two blocks, you can smell the fragrances and aromas of 14 different kinds of meals. So creating yourself is great. Well, I want to start by talking about your family. So your uncle, Manny Roth, owned the Jazz Club Café Wa in Greenwich Village in the early 60s and booked some of the first shows for Dylan and Hendrix. He not only gave Richard Pryor his first shot, he also became his first manager. and Got him his first job on the Johnny Carson show, which in uh, terms of race was a monster epic, monster epic thing. Ooh, he pissed off everybody. (laughs) <laughs> you mentioned a, an interview that your uncle did when he was 96. I found this quote, and I, and I want to read it because I thought it was so interesting, the parallels. Um, so he said this about you going over to the cafe when you were a little boy. I used to fix him up with ice cream, whatever he wanted. I didn't try to turn him on to anything, but maybe it was osmosis. I was in the center of the scene there. All you had to do was carry an empty guitar case, and the girls would follow you. Let's discuss the girls, because (laughs) Aunt Judy had legs up to her earlobes, I'm telling you, and everybody would circle around. And I remember asking Manny at one point in time, well, that's one of the comics who's always here, and he's always looking at Aunt Judy. Who is that? That was Bill Cosby. He had just gotten out of college. He was working his way. This is like early 60s, 1961. Okay. I remember coming out of the little tiny measure. said, there's somebody talking to himself in the mirror. He said, oh, that's Rich Little, the impersonator, practicing his stuff. He's on John Carson coming up like this. And uh, because Judy had all these great-looking model girlfriends, all right, and this is when Cher and Streisand were on the covers of Vogue as models and stuff like this, all kinds of characters used to get Woody Allen used to come sniffing around and they used to laugh and joke and say, nah, he's hanging around with all Judy's girlfriends. How did Manny Roth influence you? Uh, that there is such a wild diversity. First thing I saw when I walked in, I was maybe seven, eight, somewhere in the years like the 1961, like that. I was always told, remember everything, memorize everything from the time I could remember those words. So 
First thing I saw was a Virgin Island steel drum band. That's in a basement downtown. It's still there, the cafe. Yeah. Okay, McDougal, whatever. I came out of a center of a whole lot of foment and conflict, a lot of Shakespeare going on around me. And I loved it. And I learned you got to try everything. You got to eat every kind of food here. You got to get to know every kind of person here. You better start learning some different languages. You better start, start, start like that. And I did. Just haven't stopped yet. You said that the healing, happy side of your family came from your dad. And while your mom was an art teacher, you learned to box from your mother. And I'm assuming that you were speaking metaphorically? All the best boxing is technical. If you have the best super uh, technical boxers, the most adept at it, it's kind of boring to watch because it's like watching people play chess. But you learn from your mom. Oh, you bet. In what and, way? And mom is unforgiving. Mom won't sugarcoat it for you. She's been kicked out of three homes now because she's unforgiving when the food's wrong. We came from student housing. Pop, you know, had just started college, not even medical school when I happened. And well, you my, were supposedly an accident. Is yeah, that true? I happened. And so it was not a happy arrangement. Pop was never home. The only time he was in the family is when we went to visit him down at the hospital. He was an intern, a resident. In those days, you had to live there, you know, the white shoes and the whole thing. Uh, So mom was really in charge of arts and crafts and culture and so forth. And her determination started with reading. You had to learn to read and you had to learn why we read and so forth. All the way up until I was a teenager when I was finally able to, you know, at the end of high school. But she she hired a teacher to teach uh, four of my buddies and I had to read. So we went through the usual check off Shakespeare. And then uh, we did Once in Future King and so forth, you know. But going around didactic, academic, you know, what is, is it, what's the meaning of subtextual inference and on and on and on. Um, I learned early that you're going to have to cross train your brain. The same way a guitar player is going to spend his life in a corner practicing scales, the same way a Go master will dedicate his entire life. They call it training. You don't play Go. You train at Go. And then if you're good enough, you teach Go. Let's talk about your first psychiatrist visit. Your parents thought you were super active at six years old. They even thought that you might have had autism. What was the psychiatrist diagnosis? Uh, When I was born, one of my legs is about an inch and a half longer than the other one the left is. So any time you look at pictures of me doing the spinning back, uh, whirling, whatever kick, it was with my left leg. My right leg is the strongest. When I was born, I had flat feet, the rickets or whatever. It's not rickets, but, you know, et cetera. And I had to wear braces. Uh, for, I don't know, first three, four years, whatever, like that. Um, it was very unforgiving treatment back then. You had to sleep with a metal bar between your feet. And I had to spend all day and all night like that. Okay. First on my belly. And uh, if I was on my belly, I read. Mom would just leave stacks of magazines and books. Didn't matter what. Because I was just, I read because I couldn't flip over. I have two more questions I want to ask you about your childhood. I read that you shoveled dung behind a horse stable to make money before. We didn't call it dung back then. Uh, (laughs) What did you call it, David Lee? (laughs) Mierda. I couldn't wait to work to have a job. Wow. I had a job since I was 12. So you you shoveled? Shit. And I had to to go to the uh, Social Security and tell them that I was older. (laughs) But I, I went by myself, you know. And uh, told him I was older by one year than I was. And, you know, so that I could have my card and go to work for Ernie Robinson, who's no longer with us, a horse trainer. You also worked at a hamburger stand and you worked in a hospital as a cleanup boy. And this was all in... Hold on. We didn't call ourselves cleanup boys. We were, at the time, we were surgical porters and surgical techs. With all of these jobs that you had, working with horses, working in the hospital... You started to do this at a, from a very young age. Where did that drive come from? Mark Twain. Even if you don't know his writing or don't care for it at all, he was never just a one job for a whole lifetime kind of fella, but 110% application perhaps for whatever he was doing at the time. 
He started off as a reporter in the gold rush. And he described how he got off the train with four pounds of tobacco, about $35 American currency in a tweed jacket. All right. Um, uh, Henry Miller, the writer, okay. Uh, we all know him because of his sexual writings and so forth. I really don't know that I have a taste for his writings, but Henry, you've seen the movie Henry in June, got off the boat in Paris with $15 American currency, a, a, a cross pen, and one tweed jacket, okay, like that, and went and visited and tried many, many different things. Ultimately, Twain was a lecturer. In between, he wrote. And uh, we all know about it. There was a little stint in there as a steamboat operator. And I think as long as you really apply 110% and you're looking to somehow pitch in, let's just call it pitch in, and uh, make contribution is the loftier way. But shit, that smells like homework to me. I'd rather just pitch in. <laughs> but I read that when the Roth family gets together, you're expected to talk about what you did the previous year that contributed to making a better world. Is that true? Yeah. It's what what have we done constructively lately? You know, what'd you do constructive today, children? And we were called that till dad passed away about seven years ago. <laughs> Oh yeah, but it was mom who had the who had she was the book reader you follow, and uh, pop was a healer all the way up and he had blood cancer and was in the wheelchair and waited co-conspiratorially this is about ten years ago till my sisters left the room he says I need you to help me with something well we had a co-conspiratorial attitude because back in, when I was seven years old he'd, we'd sneak off to see movies mom didn't want us to see like Marilyn Monroe and Bridget Bardot. So what conversation did you have with your dad in the hospital? Uh, he said, I just signed up for Doctors Without Frontiers. I'm going to get on a boat, and I want to go to West Africa and do eye exams. I said, mm, okay, how's that work with wheelchair? He said, I don't need to stand up and do eye exams. I'll make them sit down. See where you get your industriousness. When did you first realize that you had a talent for singing? Well, we're making a wild assumption. <laughs> No, David Lee, we're really not. <laughs> Your no. Honor, that's an assumption. We're there really is no not. Basis. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not following that for that one. That is entirely a subjective comment. No, no, it isn't. <laughs> this man has a voice that sounds like water on a sick cat. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. He's mutiny on the high seas. He should have been a sailor, Judge. <laughs> I've heard you sing a cappella, sir. You have a voice. You've got the pipes. All of the people, all of the jobs, all of these experiences are in my voice. Okay? You're never completely there. You're always a work in progress. You're either going up the mountain or down the mountain. The top is about as big as this little space here. It's usually fucking freezing. I've been up some high mountains. Okay? Everybody's waiting well, you get the fucking camera ready. <laughs> and then I forgot the flag. A lot goes on up at those tiny little summits, and then it's down, down, down. All your time is ascending and then going back down the mountain. You follow? I do. Your time at the top's almost insignificant. You're freezing. You hold up the flag. Fuck, hurry up, Ray. <laughs> Stuff that shit back down there. Get your glove back on as fast as you can and vacate. So it's all in the planning. It's all in the doing. I never assumed that I was great, but I have always assumed that I could make you feel great. I can How? make you feel young and skinny from 800 yards out. Give How? Me two choruses. How? Give me a few moves, okay? We're going to engage. We're going to talk because my instrument is exactly what we're using right now. Now, I haven't started to work yet. I'm legitimately answering questions, but I could reverse this very quickly, young lady. I'm sure you could. Mm, I'll make you feel so desirable and young and fuck it, I'm going to have a drink. <laughs> mm -hmm. That one cigarette a year is right now time. So I'll buy did, you that drink. <laughs> when did you realize, when did you first realize you had a talent for singing? I never decided I had a talent But you for started singing. taking singing lessons. I loved it. You just yeah. loved it. I loved it from the time I was seven. 
okay? And it was my first school play. I was in third grade. And again, scruff of the neck, it was, okay, what this teacher's going to help you learn uh, the libretto. This teacher's different for the dancing. Now you got to go get measured for the costume. Now is dress rehearsal. It was codified in Boston, Massachusetts, um, Brookline, Massachusetts. Okay. Do you remember what play it was? Uh, well, it was about, uh, I don't remember the title, but there were different uh, facings of books. Wizard of Oz, Alice in Wonderland, etc. And I was Mr. Bookworm. I still have the glasses mom made for me, mortarboard, etc. <laughs> Shall I sing it to you soulfully? Because yes, if please. I sing it like a little kid, it's... Uh, no, sing it soulfully. I'll, I'll update it a little bit. Please. There, my name is Mr. Bookworm. I hope you likes to read. Hey, did you pay to get in here? <laughs> <laughs> and I would just go from book to book and open up and Wizard of Oz characters come out and whatnot. Uh, beyond that, I didn't learn to sing from happy and celebrative and whatnot. Um, I don't sing to celebrate. Never did. But I uh, think Give that... me two minutes and I'll share with you where I really learned to sing and where the code comes from. Because okay. I rarely ever talk about it. Okay. A fella named Salo Blumenthal. Uh. I was in fourth grade, and we were studying for bar mitzvah, all right? and uh, Not a lot of people know you're Jewish. Mm -hmm. It's the middle name, because it's Indiana, you know. And um, uh, Blumenthal would walk in, and he carried the weight of the world on his shoulders. He was as wide as he was tall, and he wasn't very tall. And we would be sitting here. We were wise acres. This is, you know, the 60s, the hippies. It's, you know, flower power and Grateful Dead and the doors and bring on through to the other side. It doesn't sound like Bar Mitzvah to most years. <laughs> and uh, Sailor Blumenthal would walk in and he'd always do the same walk. He would take his old sports coat, cheap jacket off, and take it off and he'd roll up his right sleeve first. There's nothing there. And then he'd roll up his left sleeve and he'd lock eyes with you. And he'd see the number tattooed on the inside of his forearm, which was his camp number. And then he'd roll his other arm up like that and lock up to see if you were still looking. If you were new in the class, he'd look to see because that was his orchestra number. And he would tell his story. Inevitably, the newbies in class would ask, um, what are those numbers? And he'd say, well, this was for Birkenau. And this is from so-and-so, and this is my orchestra number. And they'd say, were you, you know, what did you do in there? I said, I sang. Inevitably, somebody like a Ricky Weiss sitting behind me <laughs> or one of the Weissman brothers would go, what happened if you didn't sing good? And he was very serious. He would lean forward. He'd go, you didn't sing good. You went up the chimneys. And more than once in the next five years, I would hear Mr. Roth. If you cannot find it in yourself to sing for those who did, sing so you don't go up the chimneys. And I think of that every time I sing, every time I write, every time I dance. It is so compelling. Let's take away all the earn the money and support yourself. My latest review from somebody, somebody.com. That is the most deterministic, compelling thing that you could possibly tell a kid. Can't be more thankful. Wow, what a fucking slap, a fucking wake in the face for a kid who might have gone in a wrong direction. Keep in mind, I got sent to my first work-related environment when I was 13. My parents took me down to the police station in Pasadena and had them tell me, you fuck up again, you're going to a foster home. That's exactly what happened to me. Mom was very unforgiving. Now, okay. your sisters have said that there was a bad Dave and a good Dave, and the bad Dave came from Sybil Roth. That means assertive. Okay. It means compelling. It means determined. Okay. When you say a bad person, are you talking about ethics and moral? I think you can determine that I have a fair share of that. Absolutely. Today, what qualifies as bad... Is very different. <laughs> it's very different. Yeah. Okay. You're all, we're always compelled now more than ever, perhaps, to determine what is a good critic. Somebody who supports and enhances, 
Or is it somebody who prefers the boo instead of the a? I like that boo instead of the a. I can I know plenty of heavy metal bands that I can get on that plane at JFK and I can go boo very creatively all the way to LA. It's a five hour trip. If it's yay, oh wow, it's so great, really moving, great. <laughs> Critique, observe the flaw. Do you follow? And yeah. Diane Arbus, the photographer, she says, My whole career was based on the flaw. We all think we have it together, and I'm paraphrasing, but we all have a flaw somewhere in the program. Those pants are just a little high water short. That belt buckle, white with polyester. <laughs> And that's what's observed, and that's what is photographed, and therein lies the statement, wabasabi, it's the flaw. It's when the beautiful old buildings around here start to fall apart and decay. There's a beauty in that. And if it's not in the thing itself, it's in the feeling of impermanence that you get. And it's quiet in there. Your singing coaches taught you early on to sing like the girls. What was that about? It means that there's a range element. In your hinge, okay, is where all that power comes from, all right? Uh, If you're self-taught, well, already we have a little bit of a moment here because I think only a fool thinks that just experience can replace an education, all right? So if you want to cross-train yourself up, so you can get your voice up into that stratospheric level of Aretha Franklin levels or uh, Shaka Khan levels, okay, um, as well as singing way down. You know, my business manager out there handles Taj Mahal, old blues man and everything. You hear that grind in my voice now. And, you know, in terms of uh, how I would call what I do, I'm a soul growler, all right? And I'm not operatic, far from country. It's, wow, I'm closer to Wilson Pickett. Ha! Then, uh, in, and then a cleaner folk tone, all right, for example. When you start working with bands, somebody's always sick, whining, complaining, or just got divorced and doesn't want to sing. I'm that guy. <laughs> okay, I'll take your part. You follow? Yeah. As, as the drum major, I got to know every instrument So you were the, the understudy. Band. I got to know every instrument in the band. If you're going to to be a band director, you got to know every instrument and be able to hum it without the paper. And how many instruments do you play? Well, define play. I can sing the cover off the ball still to this day. I take lessons in jazz guitar regularly. And I started with my guitar teacher maybe 10, 12 years ago. And I said to him, I would like to be able to be at a beach bar somewhere somewhere foreign, somewhere tropical, and there's an acoustic guitar, all kinds of interesting folks sitting out. I want to be able to put a jar out front for tips and do an hour without singing, which I can do now. (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk about your musical career. By, By the 70s, you made your way to Pasadena City College, where I believe you took some theater classes, and this is also where you meet for the first time Edward and Alex Van Halen. Tell us about that first meeting. I didn't meet Eddie and Alex at uh, music school. Okay, that's close. There's, you know, it's hazy history because we didn't have smartphones. (laughs) Nobody was keeping (laughs) video. You were documenting everything you were doing on the Internet? Oh, it was a big deal, you know, uh, when you were able to document anything. Yeah. All you had was a Kodak camera that you had to go stop at the place next to the 7-Eleven, right, and come back in a week. Yeah. I knew the Van Halens when we were in seniors in high school and we were crosstown rivals, all right? I was Diamond Dave because I came from the busing program, all black and Spanish-speaking schools and other. I was the other. That and the Japanese girl who was always good at math. <laughs> And Cindy Yamazaki wins the math award again. I always have now, 34 kids. All right? You sound like you're a little jealous. Well, I do math as a way of life. I caught up. All right. Um, it had a reinforming impact on my life that is musical, social, spiritual, everything. Like I started off, you know, 
uh, I dip it in sugar so it's more digestible. But when I tell you about the cars I have, it's not because I'm trying to bro you and, dude, what are you driving, bro? I'm making a statement. What's the statement? It ain't a Tesla. It's not an off-road vehicle with knobby tires. I own a 1951 Mercury Lowrider and a 66 V dub. I'm making comments. Those are answers to questions you may not have asked yet. All right. Same thing if I tell you uh, the music that I listen to. It's a bit more predictive. All right. But in my case, whew, that's across the board because I was forced to listen to all kinds of music, you know. Uh, the running joke being, I was abused as a kid, musically. <laughs> Montavani. <laughs> Those eyebrows were working full Muzak. time right there. <laughs> it's, it, we were forced to listen to everything, and we went to free everything. Student day, student matinee. Free family day, free family dress rehearsal matinee, student day. And I saw every Broadway play and every uh, art gallery opening and... You know, on and on, museums and battleships. And it wasn't all just, you know, friends and whatever, because uh, my family was all in the military, Air Force and so forth. So we went on the battleships and the submarines and the frigates and the schooners and the museum exhibits as well. I'm a combat hippie. Peace, love, and heavy weapons, just in case they don't want to fall in love. So tell us about meeting the Van Halens. We were cross town rivals. They and played, what, were you, what were you fighting about? Well, they played heavy, heavy metal, you know, Black Sabbath kind of note for note. It was spectacular. But there were no girls in their audience. And I came from, you know, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Superfly, James Brown, uh, Al Green, you know, social music. Um, so I approached the and Amos and said, I think I know why you're not getting club gigs. Personally, I just dance test everything something is simple later that hip-hop uh rediscovered uh, aerosmith you know it's, it's a perennial well it's about al green beat probably 110 beats a minute that means you can dance without spilling your drink if it's an open drink any faster than 110 bpm you're going to start spilling your drink okay so, but which is okay, but get ready. <laughs> like that. And that's funky. And a power trio can play the hell out of that. And we did. And we ultimately had a set of some 200 songs. I personally would test. The combination was miraculous. We had a wonderful diversity to the sounds. You'll hear Latino, Hispanic sounds and influences in some of our most popular stuff, even though you think of Van Halen as, you know, hit the weight stack and, you know, conquer the next mountain kind of stuff, which it is. You know, you'll hear like at the beginning of uh, a song that a lot of folks don't know, but they know the song is uh, Jamie's Crying. It's the beginning of Wild Thing, one of the most well-known inarguably well-known hip-hop rap song. Well, that's not heavy metal. Tell us more about some of the songs and where they came from or what inspired you to write them. Broadway, in terms of the formative thinking, okay, has always been based in terms of... Let, well, let, let me isolate down to one fella. Leonard Bernstein, okay? Uh, that's uh, Porgy and Bess... And West Side Story. Let's start right there. Whether or not you know or care of the play, it's the format of it. Things like Thredonic, which means we're going to keep playing the song, but now we're going to start talking. And Now, I know Tony like I know me. That is, that is the Jets territory. And you're kind of in key, and you're moving through, and there's the narrative and ex explanations, and you actually have a conversation, and then you go, when you're a Jet, you're a... And you break into that song. So I just, just having been trained to that, I put that in a song like, I don't know, you talking about love, which I sold 10 million before MTV was even an idea. Um, and this is a time when people just were hating on our kind of music. When I came out, it was all about punk rock and mohawks on one side. And uh, I'm going to strike that pose and Saturday Night Fever, baby. 
<laughs> have your records ready. Those were amazing moments. Late 70s, easily in epoch, on par with the uh, culture like the Roaring Twenties in terms of the arts, letters, gastronomy, you know. Now, if somebody says to you, let's go see Springsteen on Broadway, are you really there to hear the songs? Me neither. You're here to there. It's mostly the in-between. In fact, got rid of most of the songs, and it's all in-between, and I'm in, because I go for in-between the songs as much as the songs, the brains, the flavor, the stories, the talk. You want me to give you a little example? Yeah. You having fun? Yeah. You go first now. What's the best meal you ever had? I had a meal at the Hotel de Grillon in 1987. It was the first time I ever tasted foie gras. Foie gras? Mm hmm. Wow. Yours? And? Oh, it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced in my mouth. It was unbelievable. What did it taste like? Heaven. Okay. You have a poetic license, and you're using it on me. My hands are up. Okay. <laughs> My story takes two minutes. Okay, let me Maybe hear it. Maybe three. And I'm going to title it, Why We Miss Anthony Bourdain So Much and Why He Was So Important. Okay. For some reason, I get worked up when I do this story. It's one of the few times I get emotional, like choked up sometimes. Whew. We thought we were going to die. We'd had four days in New Guinea, and we hadn't eaten. I can't I really have trouble with this story. And I had put the trip together, trained for it for over a year. There was four of us plus a couple of bearers, one of them named Toby, a fellow with a bone in his nose. And we were in the highland jungles of New Guinea, and we had gotten up to 10,000 feet in the Star Mountains in an attempt to crowd, ran out of food, got totally lost in the jungle where a lot of people have disappeared. We really thought we were going to die. On the third night, we sat in a circle without a fire in the rain, nothing to eat, and we went around one by one, described the best meal we ever had. And you took as long as you could so you got your mind off of things. That was the thing, okay. I described going to Cantor's Delicatessen <laughs> and getting uh, corned beef and pastrami and chopped liver on Jewish rye and described it all right down to the mustard, okay, right down to the drinks, everything. And you had to desc we described the table, the napkins, the waitresses, everything. And it got over to one of the translators. And she knew half a dozen different dialects. I don't know that he had ever been out of the country. And Toby started going off. He literally had a hole in his nose for his, you know, come out of the hill tribes. He started going, he says, it wasn't at a restaurant. It was at the beach. And he described the way the light came out of the moon and hit the leaves and bounced off the water. And he could follow that light out. He took it as far as that, like following one ripple all the way. I described the costumes of the waitresses and the smells of their perfume. Described the table. Described the plates, the sounds of the forks hitting the plates. I remember him telling that. And we all just laid back on our packs. And I thought, oh, this was going to be the end. He went on for 40 minutes before he even got to the salad. Wow. And I was laying at my pack. And we were getting like the bony chest looking shit. On. And when he finally finished, somebody without even sitting up said, Toby, where did you have that meal? And without even moving, he was laying on his back. He said, oh, I didn't have it. My wife did, and she told me about it. I don't know why I get choked up on that one. That's why Anthony Bourdain's. That's why guys like that are so important. And it's part of why I'm a storyteller today. That yeah. happened in 1985. Boy, I learned, learned to tell a story. You're clearly a really sensitive 
heavy feeling person. When you were first touring and and making the whole Van Halen thing, you came off as such a tough guy, as such a a a dude, a man about town, a playboy. How much of that was real and how much of that was something that you were, a story that you were creating? It's a plan on where are you going to go in life? You're going to climb the treasure mountain, all right? And it was a different day and age, a different time and a place, our values and who we were, what we looked like, how we demonstrated if we're tough guys or smart guys or whatever. I think that what I did was saturate living and what people focused on was mostly the travel. I saturated with visiting other countries and actually doing things there as a means of, if I go rock climbing in Paris, okay, I'm going to run into the rock climbing community and I don't have to ask anything. It'll take me. I don't have to ask, where's the apothecary? My stomach's upset. What are we having for dinner? They'll be gone. This is the apothecary. Do you need anything? Usually we get upset stomach from the water. (laughs) (laughs) And afterwards, David, we are eating dinner. Come. (laughs) You don't have to decide anything. It'll all, you become part of a community. Same thing kayaking. Kayaking here in Manhattan, this huge community of boaters and whatnot that happened here. And working from the inside out is uh, kind of been my ammo. Don't want to visit, just watch it through a window. But were you doing that with Van Halen? Well, I was I doing watching which? it through a window. It felt like you were. I mean, I've been spending the last week or so rewatching all the videos I grew up with, and the sex appeal, the bravado, the oh, ownership of the huh? stage. I mean. <laughs> In 1984, I was in college, so I felt that. You know, I lived through that. When I was young, I did as a young man does. But you you and Van Halen, you toured for years and years before you made it. But when you made it, you made it. It was zero to 60, and all of a sudden, you guys were a global phenomenon. How did you manage that? Did you always just feel like it was inevitable that this was going to happen? Or was it a surprise? We were always confident that we were going to survive and make it in show business based on a paradigm that was still a bit unusual in our culture uh, at that time and today, which was we were an album band. We were not singles driven. And even through the 70s, it's a singles culture. All right. I recorded Henson Recording. Big shout out to everybody at Henson Recording and La Brea and Sunset, because today you're going to run into a McCartney a Metallica and a Mariah Carey, all in the same day in that studio, okay? They did We Are the World in there and whatnot. But it's the most famous because that's where the mamas and the papas did all their singles. All of these are gone, <laughs> you know, etc. cetera. That's uh, the mamas and the papas. And uh, uh, what else? They're famous for all the Carpenters singles. Sing, right? sing us a, a Carpenter song. Well, I can sing it like... That we only just begun to learn, to learn. But singles is what really was, uh, you know, the 70s version. You had three-minute songs, three-and-a-half-minute songs. Uh, The idea of an album band really started to kick in then that you could make a living with that. But again, when I was discussing in the late 70s, even the Sex Pistols, uh, Jesus... uh, whatever, never mind the bollocks, you know, Antichrist, this four-minute song that was produced by the guy who did uh, Blue Oyster Cult. Didn't know that shit, did you? <laughs> but you had you had Dark Side of the Moon, all of the Yes sort of double albums that they were doing, Relayer and Topographic Oceans, which were really high concept. Yes, and you have a great memory, but for most of the world, it was all about singles because pop music, rock and music was relegated to one hour a week in Holland up up through the 80s. I'm going to mispronounce it wildly, but I was talking with Armin von Buren about, I bet you grew up to Alfred Lechunstedt's Betonsche. (laughs) <laughs> which played rock and roll one hour a week. I think it was on Wednesdays in Dutch radio. Okay. So the media got a hold. They decided you do this. You're a category. You fit like this. 
you know. But you broke all of that. Uh, it was word of mouth and also the value of a live show. Performing live uh, is uh, arguably our forte, or at least mine. Interacting with somebody, engaging with somebody directly, you know, somewhere between my Carnival Barker personality and my uh, uh, MC, okay, and Mater D. I am the devil's son-in-law. Is it true that you wrote uh, Running with the Devil in 18 Minutes? Let's qualify that for professional bearing, okay? 18 minutes and in your entire life. Well, you know, <laughs> somebody asked me that at one point. I think it might have been Howard Stern asked me. He says, how long did it take you to write uh, Running with the Devil? And I thought for a second, and the truest answer is, well, if you've watched a thousand movies and tried to memorize the soundtracks, if you've read a thousand books and tried to remember everything you've read, if you've met hundreds and hundreds of people and tried to memorize their stories, and you've had more than two or three different jobs in your life, and a millionaire, Miles, it would take about 18 minutes. Yeah, well, the, the, the great designer, Paula Scher, who designed the Citibank logo, drew it on a napkin, but said that, and it and took her about 10 seconds, but it said it took her 10 seconds but I know Paula Shear's background that goes all the way back to almost every album cover she's done. The jazz ones with the airbrush were the best. Oh, I think the Boston album, although she hates when I say that. Come on. It it is, she learned from uh, individuals that were surrounding all the best arts and crafts comes from a group, a gang, a collective. Saltz, who writes for New York, says you got to form gangs, got to form cliques alternately support with each other, compete with each other, you know, defend each other, harass each other. It doesn't matter if you're Picasso or Paul McCartney. You came from a group, a collective. And, uh, you know, for Picasso, what was it, George Watt? You know, they said they, they would decide, I am painting the Kleenex box. And Picasso would go, your Kleenex box is shit. <laughs> <laughs> and try to outpaint the exact same Kleenex box. And today we think, oh, no, auteur. He worked alone. Ah, the only one who ever did that was Prince. Yeah, some people think that the, the best way to get your best work is to have a nemesis that you are really, really competing with. Mm, well, I'm going to enlarge upon that is that your best teachers, your best coaches, the ones who are going to get the most dramatic, uh, most combustion out of your engine will be your most hated, your most feared, and your most disastrous adversary. Absolutely. Because you know how to bullshit everybody else. (laughs) Whenever I feel really, really, really bad about myself in my life, I think about what can I do to better the people that don't think enough of me. (laughs) Well, a good answer to anybody who criticizes you in any way, you 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 can drop them with a simple throw by going, you know what, you may be right. Sometimes that leads you to some self-examination, but it's even more academic than that. It's chemical. Figure out in advance something that you need to think through, whether that's a family issue. Oh, shit. How do I tell mom about this? All right, there's a reunion coming up. I'll tell my sister first. Then we'll show her the bill. (laughs) That kind of thinking. Or, oh, no, I just got fired. What the fuck am I going to do? That kind of thing. Or blank canvas, blank canvas, blank canvas, blank canvas. <laughs> Paint something, will you? Like you figure out something that you need to get your brain working on, right? Like this. And when we call channeling your fury, okay, or your pain, or your self-pity, very important. Do not be embarrassed by it. You need time to feel sorry for yourself. Tell your spouse. (laughs) All that's got to go into the work. And the time when you are most put upon some soul-crushing nonsense that happens to you, it doesn't matter if they fucked up your hot dog at Papaya King or you just got sued and lost everything. An 80-piece move. Oh, you just lost 80 pieces off the board? Can you tolerate swings like that? And your adrenaline and all that serotonin and all those great chemicals are going to kick in like when you drop the plunger on a nitrous canister in one of those cars in Fast and Furious. Number six is best. Whoa! 
And now get to thinking about what you got to fix. Have it in your back pocket. Because if you try to go, okay, I'm going to channel now. No, no, no. Your sales are up late. You're going to ruin your boat. You fucked up. Try it again next time. Go get drunk. Go to sleep. <laughs> Smoke some pot. <laughs> Slow down. If you have it ready, okay, shit, I got to think of lyrics for this first verse in this chorus. Or I got to unwind some family disaster again, okay? Then I'm like, I know I got to think of that. As soon as you piss me off for any reason. All right. I'll literally pull my jacket over my head and on the bus, the plane, the car, and get to thinking on that. And that's when that adrenaline goes to work for you. It's like napalm. Very effective. Just be very careful where you place it and have it ready. There's advice. You had a better question than my answer. <laughs> I've been very patiently sitting here. When have you felt sorry for yourself? Well, currently, the, my, my running comedy line is fear and revenge are my main pivot. I don't know if that's an answer to the question. Mm, fear and revenge. Revenge on my wristwatch because it's 10 years too fast. Okay? I wasted a lot of fucking time waiting around for the guitar player. All right? So I'm not going to change him, and I sure ain't changing history in the rearview mirror, even if I turn it. So let's turn that rearview mirror, see how good we look while we're getting somewhere. Tell the wristwatch, fuck you. And get ahead of it like grandma says. Okay? Maybe that's as close as I get to feeling sorry for me. All right? Go beyond that. Mm, I'm kind of over crybaby alcoholic millionaires bouncing on the end of the mattress, <laughs> taking up folks like your time going, well, you know, I feel, too. I feel sorry for a lot of my fellow man when I reflect that God is just. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You watch the news? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't fall into a lot of the traps that a lot of rock and rollers did. You've never been in rehab. You haven't been divorced 14 times. Well, if you read, I'm going to generalize wildly here, okay? Uh, if you read, all right, then you'll experience the lessons of others in your generation. The Miles Davis uh, biography is amazing. And there's a whole lot of traps. Here's what happens when you do this, this, and that. And here's who's liable to line up and hate on you. Yeah, but did you read the Miles autobiography back then? I started reading everything I could possibly shoplift in fourth grade. <laughs> I had a special raincoat. It was four sizes too big. Did you ever get caught? Oh, you must have when you got to go down to the police was, precinct. I got caught more than a few times. If you had even a vaguely interesting cover of a paperback or a magazine you went down the sleeve i was reading paperbacks like the carpet baggers the first real sexy one from harold robbins i knew who lenny bruce was in fourth grade how to talk dirty and influence people uh the dick gregory book the n-word that was the actual title was on the spindle up at the rexall that went down the sleeve and all of that opened up my eyes to, you know, to Gregory's first black comedian to play in white clubs in early so He's caused a big furor. And he was talking about civil rights. His book, his next book was called The Back of the Bus. I was a fourth grader, but I was an avid reader. I could read way past my, you know, my given chronological age. So that kept you from... Well, there's pitfalls. I knew what killed Marilyn Monroe, and I knew what killed Billie Holiday. Uh, I knew what killed Elvis, and I knew ultimately long before I even started listening to Elvis. Uh, history, lessons of history, you know, and if its history is mulched in with very colorful and interesting and uh, tenuous lifestyles, then you, you remember it perhaps a little better. But you never succumbed to those excesses yet. Oh, certainly I did. In what way? No. Oh, I consumed my body weight in anything that was... Uh, showed up in early books. If any of the early authors, if any of the Apollinaires did it, <laughs> if any of the, uh, again, the Henry Millers or... But it didn't overtake you in the way that it, did, that, it, way that it did Eddie. I mean, he ended up having to go to rehab. Okay. You did not. All right. To be perfectly fair, okay, I've had my wild excesses, okay, uh, but it usually involved... Uh, Corn, alcohol, and women. 
loud African American music. <laughs> the remixes. <laughs> Beyond that, though, uh, I always balanced the physical. Okay, I'll say it so you remember. Mine's working, butt's twerking. It took you I, two years to do some of those jumps you did in it jump. Took me a lot of time, and I started off physical from the time I was able to really walk and run. Parents made damn sure shit. Let me think. I walked into the garage in seventh grade, and there was a pair of parallel bars. Which in your were, garage? Yeah. In Why? The pop bottom. Olympic parallel bars. And he, he told me, you're going to learn parallel bars. Why parallel bars? He just decided. Gymnastics are revered in the Midwest. You don't need a whole lot of equipment to do it. Uh, and then ultimately, the martial arts started uh, 12 yeah on my birthday and uh, still you know all the variety when we say martial arts it's not just a fist to face confrontation it's not kickboxing and mixed martial arts you'll go through that phase all right but what you're learning ultimately is something that's much more consequential than that you're just not going to engage any adult males over 12 years old for long unless there's some move and groove and whatever. Now, in kendo class, which I attended here in New York many times, most of the participants are female. We start our little girls when they're about nine years old. Okay, you've seen what a kendo helmet looks like with the shoulder pads and whatever. And you teach your little nine-year-old girl what it means to have a 180-pound monster like me come screaming at her with a bamboo cane. Now, of course, you just lightly tap. We take care of the kids. But she learns that all the smoke and fury doesn't mean shit. Okay? All your micro traumas go out the window when you learn that screaming and yelling and sweat and threat of fuck you in 82 languages. That's what I assume right off the bat. And she'll begin to develop her core, her core strength. Now, I come from a show business where most of the folks in front office have all the spiritual core of a cannoli. <laughs> <laughs> right? You give me somebody like Gaga or Pink, yo. You dig? And there's, there's a determination there that's kind of old school, like from the 50s or something. They work hard. Gwen Verdon. And there's a new uh, documentary coming out about Fosse and Verdon, yeah. who did uh, Damn Yankees and all of that kind of a thing. Whatever Lola wants, Lola gets. Well, that isn't by genetics. You've got to teach little Lola how to swing a sword. And it doesn't have to be a sword. For me, my word is my hand, my voice is my sword. I'll get the job done long before anybody draws the pistol, Sarge. At the height of Van Halen's fame, you said that when the people scream so hysterically for such a sustained period of time, they're screaming for themselves, not for you or for Eddie, but because they see themselves reflected in the band. You feel your own strength, your own power. You feel like you could march on trouble. How does that happen? Oh, it happens almost uh, religiously. Get before me, devil. All right. If I say it like that, you go, that's a preacher's meeting, that's gospel, that's four-square Baptist. Yeah? It's the exact same mechanism. First, you start off looking at the preacher, and then your eyes roll back in your head, and you start reaching up, and it's about you at that point. You feel strength. You feel uh, the confidence. And for those who don't know how to say a prayer, I'll say it, and you dance to it. You released Van Halen, Van Halen 2, Women and Children First, Fair Warning, Diver Down, and then came 1984. Jump was actually the first video I ever saw of the band, and I was mesmerized and kind of overwhelmed by the sexuality and power of the band. Um, why did you leave the band? All rock bands are always on the verge of breaking up at any given time, okay? There's a lot of fury, a lot of competing egos. There's always going to be something that is a determining misdirective factor. Sometimes it's alcohol, and sometimes it's your wife. Okay? And the wives started going, you know what? You're the important one. You're the one the audience loves, not your brother. And they started listening. 
Why didn't you ever get married? Honestly? Yeah. I'm not well adjusted at all. I'll tell you the funny way. Okay. How many rock stars does it take to put in a light bulb? One. World revolves around me. <laughs> really? You think that that's absolutely, that's why? absolutely. And I'll level with you straight. I'm not really good for living with, in terms of outside the project, outside the team, outside the group. I don't have any employees. Well, I got an audience as of three days ago. I was standing up in front of an audience of people. Or average age probably nineteen. Okay. Aircraft carrier is owned, run, and operated by 19-year-olds. That's the average age of the crew, so don't make light of 19. So you've, <laughs> have you ever wanted to get married? Have you ever, or have you always just been like, no, not me? I probably had four or five girlfriends over my lifetime. Those are the lines in your head that you talk about, That's your forehead. Right. The deepest and shortest is Stacy from Dallas. <laughs> it is wasn't Stacey very from... long, <laughs> the relationship. <laughs> I'm, I'm having to psychoanalyze myself. Yeah. Right? And uh, I'm old enough to be perfectly honest. I'm a retro hetero. Uh, but in terms of the process and uh, courtship and whatnot, at this point in time, I'm just target. I'm just an agenda. What do you mean? It means I'm something to be appropriated. But right? what about your own feelings? My own feelings are, am I being appropriated? Am I being manipulated and maneuvered into here? Because I'm out trophy now. Right. All right. The idea that I was just going to bump into somebody and then first thing I'm going to hear is, I like the real Dave. Really? Because I haven't even showed him to you. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm assuming that we, we've gotten very little of the real Dave today. Oh, you got 100% of real Dave. Really? Here. Absolutely. Okay, good. That's good to know. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I was really struck by in all the interviews that I listened to you was how good a mimic you are. So you can do Leonard Cohen. You can do Aerosmith. You can do ZZ Top. You can do Ricky Ricardo. It's kind of amazing. Well, okay. First off, I was taught very early on from my singing teachers before I was a teenager to learn to sing in other languages. I know. Because you're using, I don't know, maybe there's 17 different muscles that make your armature, the way you set your jaw and create your tones for different languages. The way you set for Urdu is different than English, which is different than British. And it, well, it starts to move like that. The purpose being is cross-training. Trying to imitate people directly is you're also going to work that sound and... In fact, let me try and put my headsets on because what really got that going is when they fired me from doing what was supposed to be the uh, Howard Stern had left. He'd yes. gone on to Sirius XM and I got the 103 whatever, the K-Rock kind of thing. And they took away all my guests because they said I was playing too much ethnic music. We know what that means. We, that I was having late night humor too early in the morning. <laughs> my guess for Larson is so I started interviewing dead guys. Secret, I did both voices. Yeah. I, can, I can tell that. Now, yeah, yeah. Full disclosure. They were dead. <laughs> no, I interviewed <laughs> Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> like I said. And so forth. And had to do the voices. And it's like, what a Diamond Dave. It was a good man. Didn't do a little Springsteen, right? Because, and I looked out the wind and it was Clarence. And to tell you the truth, we. We'd seen saxophone players before in Freehold, but none of us had ever seen anything like the snowmobile he was riding. That is good. You start to, well, obviously, I spend a lot of time by myself. Okay. <laughs> I spend a lot of time. It's worth it if you can figure out how to do that. I have a uh, teleplay coming up I've been working on for three years. All right. What's it a teleplay? Is, well... I don't know what you're calling it today. I call it the Martians are landing. Thank you, Orson Welles. You know, it's sound effects and right. so forth. Been working on this project for three years, and uh, I play all the parts, all right? And they have varying uh, different kinds of accent, and all the Fort people who is coming to Fort Talk for David. You, you sit in airport for nothing, you maybe entertain for self. You can all of these people, why why bother? I tell you all, because every fucking one of them 
is in your voice later. It's a way of getting a little bit fucking closer, isn't it? Hello. I can tell this. Get that far into it. And don't forget, you see. My inner child's like a little fucking more than Edward James almost, you see. This was a good idea for an interview. What were you thinking, loco? I wasn't. Clearly. It's not always for fun. You know? You get that far into somebody's soul, and then that gets into your voice. Every time I sing, every one of them's in there. Yes. Orale, mija. Now you're in it, too. So are you, Essie. You've said that your favorite audience is disbelieving non-believers and non-smilers. Why is that? Oh, at the inset. If you're already loved and accepted and it's a birthday party, and yes, that's one experience. Everybody knows every word, every song that I sing, they know them better than I do. We have a fellow who imitates me perfectly, he makes a living imitating me plays in rock bands in Vegas and so forth. His name's Ralph. We call him David Lee Ralph. <laughs> and I, I watch videos of Ralph because he has every key bullet point move, you know, every archetypic thing that I do. Sometimes I forget to do the back bend. I forget to do the back bend. <laughs> no, he's, he memorized everything right down to my voice and my wow. accent. So, so you said that you're funny, but you're not happy. I'm never content. There's always some daily catastrophe or the big projects require holding your mud and staying cool. What's the most important song in Damn Yankees? You got to have heart. Okay. And then in, uh, in uh, West Side Story, stay cool, boy. Beat it, pop it. Don't try to stop it. Stay cool. And my answer to that many years later is stay frosty. Are you not happy? Yeah, routinely not. I think I'm appreciative of even the smallest and smaller and smaller things. Now, I get such a kick. I, I see my business manager. She was sitting out there. She knows what I mean when I say window time. What does that mean? It's when I get my job done. I sit in the window. I can tell the staff. I tell everybody, uh, I got to do some window time on this. And I literally will go sit in a window just like that. And it might be there four or five hours. I do not have attention deficit anything. I'll sit, uh, I can sit and just read a book and I'll be there six hours later. It's been a difficulty sometimes because everything else goes away. I have no trouble focus. It sounds to me, though, that if you're able to do that, that that could be a moment of being happy. No? Well, I'm always solving a catastrophe. I started a newsletter called The Daily Catastrophe. <laughs> And you slide it under the door on the road to everybody because the really good trips are full of destinations which the traveler cannot expect. But I can predict for you, you better bring a parka, some Band-Aids, some mosquitoes. It's a long list, Deb. Yeah. <laughs> and it has is, nothing to do with your destination. But what is catastrophe and happy? How are they correlated? Or how is catastrophe and unhappiness correlated for you? Happy for me is identifying the deception. Oh, that's so cool. Whether that's on a chessboard or in a business negotiation or listening to a political speech, that's a popular one today. You follow? So, or whether it's wandering into a catastrophic situation and getting everybody settled down and making directive sense of it. I like that. It's, it's not adventure till the shit starts pouring out of the skies anyway. So no, it, no mud, no Woodstock. Is it about control? Oh, certainly. And it's about the challenge of, okay, now use your tools. You, you called up for this. You didn't just wander into it. All, you know, you got ready, got your mind right, got yourself right, whatever that meant. Whether it's a debate or whether you're going to try and walk across Borneo. I know some fellows who did that. I prefer debate. <laughs> Either way, we banked our ideas and got ready. All right? 
Yeah. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out the correlation between catastrophe and happiness, but I do think that it has something to do with control. Oh, it absolutely has to do with control. But then the crucible of human emotion doesn't happen up until 13,000 feet. That's when everything disintegrates and you can't sleep more than two hours and all of the fears and the paranoias and the demons kick in and everybody starts arguing with each other and going, you know what? I've always hated the way you chew your food. <laughs> really? <laughs> now you're they talking start about to love. fall apart at those kinds of <laughs> altitudes. Yeah. What made you decide to start Ink the Original? Ink the Original is a product of my complaining, whining, almost killing myself and almost killing the team dozens of times out climbing, kayaking, surfing, camping, camping, more camping, walking, bicycle. I use my bicycle every day to go to the 7-Eleven instead of the car. All right. I'm an expert at what not to do. Why is that? I've done everything wrong. I have nine really good scars all over me. I got seven surgeries. I'm I'm the bionic dude, the Watkins team, <laughs> Dr. Duffy, and you know, these guys forget it. They saved me. Yo, everything you've seen that uh, Free Solo, the movie, oh, I've almost uh, killed myself on all those climbs. Unbelievable. <laughs> couple of Alex's climbs, I almost killed the team. <laughs> that movie I make no bones. It's incredible. It's no not bones. about free soloing. It's about persistence. It's an incredible movie. Yes. If I'm an expert at anything in outdoor craft, field craft, and so forth, that's where it comes in. And over the years, um, swearing up and down, okay, I'm going to create this, 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 and that, and here are all the basic concepts. Well, I started with when I went and showed mom my tattoo. And she says, what do you do when you go to the beach? Okay, there's special requirements here. And beyond, okay, it's got to be sent free, transparent, blah, 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 reapply. Reef Wait safe. a minute. Wait a second. What about if I go climbing in this shit? Last thing I want to do is get this on my hands again. You want to go into the salt water? Let's not kill the reef. I did not realize in my insular world that there was a huge, huge market for this. I started creating stuff that was for folks who really do live in unforgiving environments. I call it backpack friendly. All right. It's got to be identifiable in a foreign language. I can identify things in foreign languages, but in case I have to tell the cook, memorize this one. You see my ink logo, can you handle it with gloves, etc.? Because all of our stuff is tactical and practical. What made you decide to start the company? What made you decide to take your life in this direction? I've never been in business outside of art-centric song and dance. I saw it as an opportunity. Here we are expanding into, quote, an unknown territory where I can use virtually all of my skills and talents, starting with connecting people with great big ideas and then motivating them all, getting them, well, Grandma used to call getting them all north, getting everybody going north. <laughs> Think like a scoutmaster. And sometimes I'm in front going, follow me. Half of being a good scoutmaster is looking over your shoulder 50% of the time going, count up. <laughs> And then handing over the responsibility to somebody else and going, all right, I'm going to go in back, make sure we didn't lose anybody. And I get to do all of that in many, many different departments and divisions of what we do here that are far more expansive than simply making records or perhaps even touring. Although it is supremely inclusive of everything in those departments that I've learned. You have, I believe, over 60 products now. What kind of products are you making? Can you talk about what they are and what they're used for and why? Yeah, it's for unforgiving environments, having lived out of a suitcase or a backpack on a tour bus or on a boat or on an airplane. It's not just amphibious assault. Sure, we're military friendly, but it means family events, spring break, Fixing that goddamn tire right outside of Vegas. Again, I told you about that tire, Deb. <laughs> so it's skincare products that protect skin that is both tattooed or not tattooed. Well, if I can protect your Rembrandt, that's an investment of emotion. It's an investment of money. 
it's a responsibility way more than I'm going to the beach for three days. What do you got? What made you believe that this was a viable market? Tattoos today, ink today, is the only true Esperanto. I've visited tribes who don't have music, who don't dance. Usually people go, everybody has dance. No. That's telegraphic. <laughs> not, not everybody sings. There are religions that forbid singing or governments. <laughs> they say no singing, no dancing. But everybody has a mark. Everybody will carry the mark, even if it's not ink. Somebody who uh, Islamic or uh, Mohammedan, whatever, when you are bowing three times, four times a day, you'll have a mark. It's the same as a tattoo. It says who you are, where you've been, where you're going. Right? It's how we communicate when we no longer speak each other's language. If you got cupcakes on your forearm, you're a baker. You got pinnacles on your shoulder blade, you, you were a prisoner somewhere. You got four little dots, where'd you do your time? You got hearts in a musical note. I see you up near Lincoln Center. You Juilliard? Yeah, I know it's a violin case. My name's Dave. <laughs> Right? You see what I'm saying? I do. Okay. I read that when you're at a sushi bar, you might consider folding back a little of your shirt sleeve to get better service. Uh, that works till they figure out I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> How on earth do they figure that out? Are you wearing a yarmulke? <laughs> the, the sense of humor. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. There, are, there is yeah. no Jewish chapter of the Yakuza. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt there ever will be. And if they have a sense of humor, it's certainly not larcenous, co-conspiratorial, and uh, laugh to win. So. Now, you're not just going after the tattoo world with this new product line with your company. You're actually going after companies like Procter & Gamble. If I can protect what I perceive to be the most difficult thing to protect, you've got a Picasso on your arm there. If you want to wait around to you're my age to hit the weight stack, you'll look like a 60-something who goes to the gym three times a week. <laughs> Outstanding work. Let's try again. <laughs> start now. You'll be able to fool them for years, says me. All right? Well, if you start keep early, that tattoo supposedly looking good. It's... It'll, keep, it'll last a whole yeah. lot longer, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Using that accelerated technology... The rest of it now is at our hands, okay? Because we can do packaging, we can do printing, we can do marketing. There's probably 17 different labs that we deal with now for our products. Because if you want the best beeswax, you're going to Carolinas. And my directors of affairs do that specifically, all right? Most of the products that we deal with on the Dwayne Reed shelf are just made in New Jersey at a single factory with a French name. <laughs> You're all thinking of it, right? Because <laughs> there's it, about four of them that yeah, have French say, names, Furmanish? and they're all made. And they're <laughs> yeah. all made in New Jersey at one factory. That factory makes all of this stuff. And I took a small batch artisanal approach. I've used the example of ice cream. Everybody likes ice cream. Everybody generally likes coconut vanilla. Well, if you want to make some really, really superb. Vanilla coconut ice cream. Going to have to learn some French because the vanilla lady lives in Tahiti. <laughs> and the cow lives up in Wisconsin. You don't have to learn French. Thank you. Although the cow appreciates it. <laughs> really, it's way more work. It is way more labor intensive. Adds a few cents more to the price, but what you're getting is the equivalent of super fine, small batch scotch. Super, you're getting a case of the best premium Dom Perignon, okay? The, the best stuff. How's the business doing so far? Superb. We just had a fellow offer, no shit, 25 large to get involved in investment, 25 million. Nice. straight up and we're in our very first season but take a look around when you think of ink you won't be able to see anything but virtually everybody is walking around with some version of who i am where i've been and who i plan on being why do you think that that change has shifted i mean 50 years ago 40 years ago maybe even 30 years ago you know, people that were wearing tattoos were subversive they were Prisoners, they Which were... is exactly why we started wearing it. 
because it works to the anti-hero. And the anti-hero doesn't mean the bad guy. Okay? Think of all those old Clint Eastwood movies. Think of any detective movie. The hero is always arguing with the police boss. God damn it, Callahan, you break up any more cars, I'm never... <laughs> Every police thriller has the irate police chief. It's a right? trope, yep. And the hero is anti that guy. He's going to break the rules to get it done. Okay, that's what the anti is. And the anti-hero is probably going to have sideburns. He might smoke cigarettes. He might actually be a Tony Soprano kind of guy. He may wear blue jeans instead of a business suit. And he probably has a tattoo. Rock and roll has made our living in the rebel cell. <laughs> you know, this is, we are anti-heroes. We're against, supposedly, the codified, the format, the expected, the overly conservative. You follow? Yeah, so. but that's not really rock and roll anymore. Oh, yes, it is very much. Well, I mean, yes, no, it's still rock and roll. There just aren't that many people doing it in that well, way. Rock and roll has transmogrified, and now they're wearing businessman haircuts exactly. and anti-gun lobby. Okay, it's the same. Anti-gun lobby is the same as we're not going to take it because of uh, civil rights or we want the vote. Also, we're always confronted, I've uh, been really aware of this since living in Japan, with our, our we, and I'll say to myself, am I going to be an original or an archetype? And what is your answer? Both. Out of the How do you tell the difference? Well, I think the original is a combination of many different types. If you, if you really follow note for note, okay, I'm going to be an archetype. This haircut, that kind of cigarette. Okay, let's, let's build one. French archetype, late 70s. The American uniform was a bomber jacket. Levi's, straight-legged, okay. Cowboy boots. <laughs> You follow three day face <laughs> Marlboro cigarettes. It's archetype. All right, I'll take the cigarette and the boots. But over here, <laughs> I dig those Viet Cong pajama pants. We'll take a pair of those. And I like over here. You know what? I'm just gonna wear that trench coat. It's, it comes from different places. Original. You're going to borrow an access. You're going to extrapolate. You're going to extract, and uh, you're going to use it. It's going to, you're going to make it your own. And you do. David Lee, I have one last question for you. You said that you simply have to be creative all the time. You have to create new things, and you never have writer's block. What advice would you have for somebody that does have writer's block? What would you tell them? Banking. Don't sit in the middle of the room waiting for Jesus to talk to you. He's busy. You bank your ideas long before you sit down in front of a microphone or before you sit down at the empty page with a pen in hand. I do both. Before you approach the canvas. As you go through your day, anything that inspires you, in for me, it is language. That's a big pivot to me. So the taxi driver may have an expression. Taxi driver turns, I said, how's it going? He tells, huh, there are some days. Wow, what a title. Add two dots to it, there are some days. That's a song title. Well, That's I a book be, title. That's the title of a lot of my history. <laughs> <laughs> and don't be foolish enough like I do to think you're going to remember it. Bank it. Put it on the page. You follow? I do. That's the simplest expression of it. You're banking your thoughts, your ideas, and no, no useless days. No wasted days. Wasting time is important to me. There's time that you just want to do nothing. Look out the window. Yeah. Is, is, means a lot to me. But even that is kind of slotted in. It's not infinite. Um, and it's not that I feel that I have to be productive. It's I realize now that I am surrounded by input, stimuli, and banking it. You seem to squeeze every single moment out of life. 
I've seen folks who've wasted a lot of time, and I've heard the expressions, you know, uh, wasting talent is a sin. If you have a talent for something, then it usually means other folks can go along on the trip with you. All right? So I'll take it out of the super personal first person. And in terms of wasting time, if you have the talent, for example, to put together an idea and then guess what? We're Now we're going to take our idea we're going to go to Europe with it. And you waste time and you go, I don't want to. I don't want to go. Well, what about everybody else who threw in with you? Not everybody's going to be a group leader in life. Somebody like yourself, you're a team leader. It is incumbent upon you for everybody else who throws in with you to do field trips, <laughs> to illuminate, to entertain. You dig? And if you can't find it within yourself, you do it for them. You follow my reasoning. Yes. So, David Lee Roth. Thank you for being such an incredible force in the world, and thank you for joining me today on Design Matters. Deborah, great questions. Thank great you. ideas. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tapes Archive podcast. Please remember you can always find more information about the show and the individual episodes at our website, thetapesarchive.com. Until next time, the vault is closed. <laughs>